Mike DeWine gets a serious primary challenge and the COVID vaccine debate takes an odd turn. Joining us on Columbus on the record this week, Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press, Gene Krebs, former state legislator, and Joe Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. Former Congressman Jim Renacci has been criticizing Governor DeWine on Twitter and in select interviews for months, hinting at a primary challenge. This week, he made it official, coming out guns blazing, while the governor took the news in stride. Mike DeWine is a career politician. He's been campaigning since the Jimmy Carter era. He was handpicked by the establishment to be governor. The insiders who installed him knew the deal. He works for them, not for you. DeWine's failures have hurt Ohio. Throughout my career, there's been a rare, it's a rare time that I do not have a primary opponent. That is the nature of life. That's the nature of politics. And so, uh, you know, there's gonna, going to be a primary. That should not be shocking to anyone simply because there's virtually always a primary in, in, in the races. Julie Carr Smythe, Governor DeWine doesn't seem to be too nervous, at least publicly, but this is not really a surprise because Jim Renacci has been making noise for quite some time. Right, and I think that um, Mike DeWine is well known, uh, established in the state, and as, as Renacci's uh, ad talks about, that can be a pro and a con though for a politician uh, if, if he gets into a divided primary. Uh, but obviously, Renacci wants to run to the right of Mike DeWine, who's who's gotten some criticism from the, the uh, folks who did not want to wear masks, who felt that his uh, pandemic responses were too aggressive, were bad for the economy and so forth. And so I'm sure he's been expecting it for a long time. Uh, and I think that... Uh, he is going to take it in stride, probably. He'll be well organized, and um, we'll just see where it goes from there. Gene Krabs, you live out in uh, far western Ohio, sort of the heart of uh, sort of the far right in, in Donald Trump country. Is Mike DeWine vulnerable out there? Does Jim Renacci have a chance among uh, the far right conservatives out, out in your neck of the woods? I've consulted with several local prominent Republicans here. And I think the way to judge it is um, counties that have more livestock than people should be your first sorting mechanism on this. And um, they don't expect Renacci to necessarily win outright in these counties, but they expect him to get a significant amount of the vote, um, maybe up to 40%. Um, so there's some real concern. Uh, the real concern is, is that th this will, the tossing of the mud um, will long-term hurt Mike DeWine when it comes to the uh, general election for, for the governor. Joe Moss, is that what Democrats are hoping? A really tough primary for Mike DeWine, Jim Renacci? There is a third candidate also. He's a farmer less well-known. That, As Gene said, that it muddies up the, the governor for whoever he faces in the Democratic race, whether it's Nan Whaley or somebody else. Yeah, you know, and, and once upon a time, uh, I, I would have said, uh, yeah, you know, uh, let's have the most conservative or uh, most radical candidate that um, that the Republicans can find so that that should give Democrats an advantage. I don't feel that way anymore. I'm concerned about the overall direction of the state, uh, the changing demographics in the state of Ohio, at least as of right now, and with the exception of the larger population centers. And I think that uh, a, a more uh, conservative, and I hate using that word in this tent, let's talk about a more Trumpian candidate uh, might win. And that is of some concern, but not <laughs> concern for everybody, not just for the uh, uh, Democrats or for the Republicans. Julie Carr Smythe, politicians you know, of, of, of note who have a big name and resources tend not to get in races. They don't think they can win. I, for the most part. So he must, Jim Renacci must think he can win. And he went to New York reportedly, met with Donald Trump. It's hard to believe he would go to New York, meet with the former president without getting assurances of his endorsement before he announces formally he's going to run for governor on the GOP side. However, um, uh, Donald Trump is the 
coveted endorsement in a lot of races. We're seeing the same thing in our U.S. Senate race here. And from what I am understanding, Donald Trump has been pretty cryptic with folks. He's not really laying out, here's what you need to do in order to get my endorsement or promising endorsements. He just likes to be at the center of attention and to be talked mm. about in these races. Um, and that's kind of uh, keeping the Trump brand going more than anything else in some ways. Gene Krebs, we're, we're coming out of this pandemic. Mask mandates are going away. We're seeing more and more faces, faces we haven't seen in over a year. A year from now, actually 11 months from now, is when voters go to the polls. Will the, will the anger over Mike DeWine's handling of the pandemic, will that have faded among the hardcore anti-DeWine folks after about a year? I, I've seen in my conversations with my neighbors and relatives around here, I've seen no evidence of any diminution of that intensity towards Mike DeWine on this particular issue. So they have long memories. Very, and I expect them to, unfortunately for the Republican Party, I expect them to uh, still want to basically, they're, they're seeking grievance and they're going to, they're, they're, they're looking for grievance and they're, they're, they will be exacting some retribution, I'm afraid. Joe Moss, to your point about not taking anything for granted, Jim Renacci sort of fell into the Senate race four years ago against the incumbent Sherry Brown. He was first running for governor, then switched over to the Senate race, sort of midstream or early, early stream. Uh, was outspent four to one, yet only yeah. lost by six points to a much yeah. to the incumbent and a much better known candidate, Sherry Brown. Yeah, you can't you can't equate the spending with the results at the at the end. You could have candidates that spend zero, uh, literally zero, and and still have a decent showing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, Sherrod Brown uh, is a is a is a known entity and and a powerful and and popular candidate. And fortunately, he gets uh, enough of the of the votes across the street to be able to get elected. Now, I'm concerned about what Gene said uh, regarding uh, folks being angry. And let's face it, the only reason for this anger has nothing to do with perspectives as to whether businesses should have been open during the pandemic or uh, the mask or anything else. It has to do with allegiance to Donald J. Trump. And uh, I, I'm concerned as to how long that is going to go on in, in our state and everywhere else. Julie Carr Smythe, you can see even in, in Jim Renacci's first uh, ad, first campaign video, that he's going to use the corruption issue. Nan Whaley is going to use the corruption issue, the nuclear bailout issue. We'll talk about it in a moment, but it still hangs over the state house. That's certainly going to be perhaps issue number one as we come out of this pandemic over the next 11 months. Right, and I think it's fascinating that uh, at the state house, lawmakers are starting to finally talk about it, uh, wanting to get Larry Householder expelled. Um, and, you know, there isn't yet support for that, but, you know, everybody wants to get rid of that, who wants to run for election as a Republican. Uh, and certainly Mike DeWine has not been attached to that per se, but he did appoint the PCO chairman who whose house was searched. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, there are tentacles of that that could continue to kind of affect that race next year. Okay. Over the course of the past eight or nine months, we've learned that COVID vaccines are up to 95% effective and have minimal, usually brief, side effects. This week, Ohio lawmakers learned during a formal hearing on the vaccine mandate bill now before them, that vaccines, these vaccines can also connect you to the 5G network and keep you from losing your car keys. But I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the Internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. They can put a key on their forehead. It sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck, too. I got this. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? Questions. We have questions. Gene Krebs. First, it can get pretty warm in those rooms, right? As a veteran lawmaker. Yes. So perspiration. Get quite humid and quite steamy. Perspiration could be a reason why the magna, the uh, the metal stuck to that woman. Have you seen anything so bizarre? 
Um, probably not since the turtle dove bill of 1994. <laughs> I did an experiment here on the farm. I have a very powerful magnet that I use to fish bolts and nuts out of combine insides when I drop them inside it. And so I checked all my keys and like most farmers, I have probably 80 keys that fit nothing anymore. And I, but I can't throw them away in case I need it for that one lock. And I went through there and I checked them. I had three of those keys that were made of something that would be magnetized. So this was an interesting um, exercise in democracy we saw. So you don't have any extra spoons and forks though. So we, that, the jury's yeah. still out on those. Julie, right. you, you've seen these hearings. You've been in many of these hearings. Have they taken a turn for the bizarre, or has there always been kind of a fringe element to, to these hearings? Well, I mean, I think that what we have to look at is what is the topic of the bill in question? I mean, the bills themselves are, you know, they're aimed at, at limiting uh, the use of vaccines, of limiting the powers of the governor. And as we just talked in the first segment, um, you know, that's what's bringing up these uh, these topics, because many, many Ohioans believe a lot of the uh, myths and conspiracy theories and, and false facts that have been per perpetrated uh, both uh, about elections and about the virus. Joe Moss, I mean, this the, the topic of this bill is a serious issue. We, we, we saw the clips, which are, you know, has been all over the Internet worldwide, people making fun of it. But the bill itself would ban companies from requiring their employees to get medicine, to get a vaccine. So hospitals couldn't require their employees to get the flu shot. And on the, on the other hand, hospitals cannot require their employees to get the flu shot, which would possibly expose patients and others to the flu. And this takes away from that. You saw the woman in the front row there. She, was, she supports this bill. She had a yes on the vote yes on the bill, and she was in disbelief. So this just takes away from the merits of the, of the legislation. Well, it, just like uh, conspiracy theories tend to take away from the merits of any kind of legislation, one of the things I'm concerned about in this particular bill, if I remember correctly, is that it also allows for private prosecution, uh, that is for individuals, if the, if the state does not want to uh, protect the so-called rights of these individuals, that, that private individuals, and actually would be activists, can act instead of the state in order to advance that. And I've always, always, always been concerned about uh, measures like that, which have appeared in, in other states, uh, as well as recently in, in Ohio. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a unique thing and it's a weird thing. And uh, the in, uh, in injection, no pun intended, of uh, the conspiracy theories into otherwise potentially uh, libertarian uh, argument, I think it's uh, counterproductive. Gene Krebs, take us a little bit behind the curtain. How are these folks, now it was all over the, over the internet that these folks were invited to testify. You were a lawmaker, you, if you support a bill, or you think someone can offer something, you invite them to testify. Do you, have, do you vet them ahead of time? Do you know they're gonna spread conspiracy theories or is this, was well, this a surprise? I, when I was there, I tended to do so to you know make sure they were gonna be a credible witness um, and not come in with anything too far afield. We kind of had a little vetting process we would do. What this tells me is that that particular legislator believes this stuff. And um, to, to give you an idea that there's a real cultural difference, I think, um, that may be hard for many people to understand between what, you're, what, what you who live in Upper Arlington, Bexley or Dublin and what we have in other parts of the state. I was telling a neighbor of mine that I'm now doing yoga three days a week to increase my um, flexibility. And she looked right at me and told me that yoga was the pathway to paganism. And um, so I, how do you bridge that discussion point with some of these folks? I frankly have no idea. Yes, well, it just goes to show you, you can't believe everything you read on the internet, except if it's AP or WOSU, right? So anyway, over the past few election cycles, the one statewide office where Democrats have had some success is the Ohio Supreme Court. Democrats hold three of the seven seats, and now one of them wants to sit in the middle seat. Justice Jennifer Bruner has announced she is running for chief justice. She would succeed Maureen O'Connor, who must leave because of age limits. 
There are no official candidates on the Republican side, but Justices Sharon Kennedy and Pat DeWine, the governor's son, are said to be considering running. Joe Moss, Jennifer Bruner is already on the court. What difference would it make for her in a, or a Democrat to be in the chief justice's role? On a number of levels. And, and by the way, she's, a, I, I think, a remarkable candidate. She is uh, uh, extremely smart. Uh, I, I think she has a, a, a clean record across the board. I've, I've uh, appeared in front of her uh, a number of times. Uh, but the, the advantage is that the chief justice does set most of the policy. And I'll give you an example, a recent example. Uh, at the, a year ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the Chief Justice, Maureen O'Connor, uh, was asked as to what should it be the policy of the courts throughout the state of Ohio concerning uh, the measures to fight the pandemic. And uh, her response, and, and this was similar to her responses in other issues of this type, uh, was to say that we do not have a unified system of courts in the state of Ohio. And as a consequence, since all the judges are elected, they had a right to control their courtrooms. I have a feeling, and if you look at the statement of uh, Justice Bruner and her announcement, that uh, maybe she was inspired by uh, Chief Justice O'Connor's reluctance to act and felt that notwithstanding that, that the court has, should have been, should have exhibited more leadership on that. So, yes, in establishing policy, in appointing judges in cases of recusal and so on, uh, the, the, those are the administrative uh, uh, functions that the chief justice can carry out. Gene Krebs, what does it mean if the Republicans lose the chief justice seat? Uh, well, on one level, not much, because uh, even if Mike DeWine loses, he will still be in office for a long enough time period to make a, to make an appointment. But I should tell you that, in full disclosure, um, uh, Jennifer Bruner and Sharon Kennedy, the, re the possible Republican nominee for this, are very, both of them are very good personal friends of Jan and myself. So uh, I, you know, I, I admire both of both ladies very, very much, and I wish them both luck. Um, Sharon Kennedy will be, in my opinion, the likely um, uh, nominee. Mm -hmm. Julie Carr Smythe, we always, we always watch the names when it comes to these races because, for now anyway, there's no D or R after the name when they're on the ballot. There is a move to, to change that. But we have three names, Bruner, Kennedy, and DeWine are the three leading candidates, speculation still. But those are three pretty good names to have on the ballot. Yeah, that would, that would make it tough. It wouldn't be so much that a voter walks in and by default picks the Irish uh, surname or the female candidate, which often does happen with court races when they don't have the party uh, designation. Um, Jennifer Bruner, well known as Secretary of State, obviously. She's run for U.S. Senate. Um, she's been a judge on a couple of different uh, tiers of the court uh, and now a Supreme Court justice who won by almost 11 percentage points just a year ago. So that is an amazing name. Of course, DeWine. Uh, as we already talked, uh, what that name will bring to Pat DeWine is, is questionable right now. Um, it because Mike DeWine it has you know been at the helm during this really controversial time. Uh, but Kennedy, I mean, what can you say about Kennedy? You know, we many people uh, love uh, Irish American surnames for yeah. courts. Particularly, I, I don't know why that is, but at one point I think we had an O'Connor and O'Donnell and O'Neill uh, and a few yeah. others on the court. So um, yeah, that would that would be a race where they would actually have to campaign and and you know distinguish themselves. One thing that could change, Joe Mas, is there is a law a bill before lawmakers that would put the D next to Jennifer Bruner's name would put the R next to the Republican candidate, whoever that is. How much we have? Do, how much do Democrats worry about that? Yeah, that, let me tell you, it's really interesting. I uh, About half of the states have elected judicial positions and then have had hybrids that have to do with uh, selection committees and, and things of that nature. Uh, and and what, what does Ohio do? Well, Ohio has partisan races, but the candidate himself or herself cannot have a D or an R next to it. I have often thought that it would be to everybody's advantage to go ahead and have the D or the R. Because right now, as, as Julie mentioned, basically what it is, it's not the Irish name or whatever, it's 
uh, it's a, it's a name that they recognize. And we've had two judges, friends of mine here in Franklin County. One of them was Tim Horton, the other one, Ann Taylor. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you get a name that is recognized, you have a very good chance of being elected. No Dunkin' Donuts? No Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' <laughs> Donuts. All right. The cloud of the nuclear bailout continues to hang over the state house. This week, lawmakers held hearings on whether to remove State Rep. Larry Household, the former speaker, is the central figure in the $61 million bribery scandal. Lawmakers are also considering changing who prosecutes cases of public corruption. Right now, the Franklin County prosecutor handles the state house cases because the state house is in Franklin County. The new bill would move those prosecutions to the lawmakers' home county. The Republican-led move comes five months after a Democrat took over the Franklin County prosecutor's office from a Republican. Jim Krebs, you had pointed this possibility out months ago. What do you think about this plan? Should the home county prosecutor for state cases, now Larry Household is a federal case, so that's different, but for state cases, should the home county prosecutor take it? There's going to be a practical problem, and I'll, I'll just pick on poor Ashtabula County, which is four hours away from Columbus. So if a lawmaker from Ashtabula commits a crime at the state house, of corruption, bribery, uh, sexual escapades, pick pick something. And that means then that prosecutor has to ship staff and come down here to interviews, all that stuff. And it's gonna have they're gonna have to stay overnight. It's gonna it's gonna greatly increase their costs and make them less likely to do a thorough enough job because of the budgetary constraints these small rural far flung counties ex experience. Um, I, this is something that also, I think every member who votes for this, you've heard me talk before about glass ceilings when, in the General Assembly. Anybody who votes for this proposal is going to have another glass ceiling opposed upon them because it's going to look like they're trying to weasel out of any consequences of their vote on House Bill 6. By the way, we're expecting 120 to 130 people to have their lives and careers ruined as a result of House Bill 6. Wow. Uh, Julie Carsmythe, is there a fear, is there a legitimate fear on the part of lawmakers that there is a Democrat in charge of the prosecutor's office? But, it, but Ron O'Brien was there for two decades, a Republican. Is there a real fear that the, the, new, the new sheriff in town could be tougher on him? Um, I, I haven't talked to, to anyone directly about that, but that would definitely be my guess. I mean, it, it looks very... Uh, questionable when obviously it's been 60 years that that uh, depart that that office has prosecuted state house crimes um so why now you know ron o'brien was just in forever and you know was extremely powerful uh in terms of what was happening with behavior and misbehavior at the state house so you know the partisan uh, question has to be raised yeah. and uh like gene says it's interesting that um, they would do this themselves, I guess, either thinking people aren't watching or thinking that they won't understand it or it's too nuanced, but it, it just doesn't look, it doesn't really pass the smell test. Yeah, and before Ron O'Brien, of course, was our friend Michael Miller, was the prosecutor in Franklin County, a true Republican right. as well, like Ron O'Brien. Joe Mass, you, Gene pointed out the logistical problems of trying to prosecute a crime or investigate a crime four hours away. What do you, what's your take as an attorney? Yeah, I, I tell you what. When I when I read this uh, a, a day or two ago, I, I I thought it was a joke. I could not make this up. So the remedy, in order to prosecute and 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 try to bring justice to corruption cases, is more corruption. Is to allow the people that uh, elected you in your county to be the ones to decide your future. And it may very well be in today's climate. I mean, look, we've been talking about Trumpism the entire show. Uh, that you'd have somebody that that would be acquitted uh, on political grounds. I mean, look look at what happened to Householder. Householder got elected after he got indicted. So it's I I, I find it incredible, and and it has nothing to do with Democrat or, or Republican. I, I I think that the 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 Republican prosecutors that we have had, I mean, give or take and depend. Uh, have been straightforward and, and have brought forward prosecutions against both Republicans and Democrats when they have, when they have been caught. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's that much political, except they might be afraid of Gary Tyak in yeah. this particular case, not because he's a Democrat, but because he's Gary Tyak. 
Mm. And, and that may be part of the motivation. Okay. It's time now for our final off the record parting shots, perhaps some predictions like Gene had uh, for the weeks and months ahead. And Joe Moss, we'll start with you. Mike, as a former horse trainer and writer, I was moved by the story of Liberty, a 16 year old Belgian mayor that after six years of loyal service to the Columbus Police Violent Unit was laid to rest this week after battling recent illness. A memorial was hurled, held for her at the department's paddocks on the west side of Columbus and her human partner, retired Sergeant Bob Forsyth, gave the eulogy. Great, Gene Krebs. Um, Democrat candidate for governor, Nan Whaley, has put together a very impressive campaign, very impressive staff. And my advice over this show right now to Governor Mike DeWine is you need to take your game up several notches regarding a whole series of issues, but including our aforementioned discussed House Bill 6, uh, if you're going to get past Nan Whaley. Okay, and Julie Carsmy. And I would just say that in terms of a Republican primary, you know, we're still watching to see if Representative War Warren Davidson gets into that race. Uh, you mentioned uh, Joe Blystone, the farmer from Canal Winchester. Uh, and if you look at a divided primary on the Republican side, you know, uh, uh, I guess a, a secondary candidate doesn't have to win more than 25, tw maybe 20 percent of the vote at some point. So it, it could be a crowded and interesting race. Yeah. A uh, home contractor I met with recently said he is encouraging his crews to get vaccinated because his customers are asking about it. So I predict we will soon see construction trucks with the words license, bonded, insured, and vaccinated. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. We're on Twitter for now. We're on Facebook. Still not yet on TikTok, but we'll consider that. And of course, right at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.